Welcome to Northern Lights, a look at Minnesota books and writers. We hope you enjoy this discussion of Minnesota literature. Hello, I'm Kay Bonner Nee, and welcome on this lovely fall day at the end of September in 1997. And I have the very special privilege today of having with me John Hassler. Everyone knows John Hassler, or certainly all women do. And I think probably that at this moment, I am the envy of many, many women in Minnesota and all over because I'm here with John Hassler. John is read by everyone, men, like his books too there's no question about that but he's something very very special with women they just eat up every book that he writes John why do you think that women are just so enchanted by your books well I uh, I guess I have strong women in my books for one thing uh, and I think that grows out of my experience in life. Uh, when I was growing up, my mother was a strong woman. My aunts were around a lot. Uh, they, they made the, the big decisions in our lives. Uh, they caused things to happen more than the men did in my family. I, I think that carried over into my books. I think of Agatha McGee in, in particular. She's, she's strong. She makes big decisions. She, she orders people around. Uh, I think it's the strength of the women, and then I think uh, there's also uh, there's, there's consolation in my books. People go through a lot of problems in my books, but uh, there's strength there. They come through them, most of them. Some don't. Miles Pruitt, poor Miles, he didn't come through it, but most of them, well, most of them survive. Even the bad people survive. I notice uh, as I look back. Uh, they uh, most people come through these experiences, and they're stronger for them. You know, I think there's another reason, too, and that is that the characters in your book, you take very ordinary people and you make them extremely interesting. I mean, I think you can read one of your books and identify. Mm -hmm. well. And this is important. I mean, these aren't people who've necessarily uh, gone to the moon and back or are engaged in uh, some great fashion industry or any of that. Yeah. They're the sort of people who, who could live next door to me. And, but they're interesting. Yeah, well, I, I, a reviewer one, once said of my work that I, I'm able to make good people interesting. Yeah. And uh, I guess ordinary people would fit that, too. I'm, I'm proud of that. I, I think that's, that's what I try to do. And I thank you for it. Oh, good. <laughs> and I know that many people do, oh, probably nice. women in particular, although I know you do. I have to keep emphasizing you do have a lot of yeah. men fans. Too, well, I think, I think women are, are more uh, prevalent readers of serious fiction. You know, more, four, four, four out of five uh, fan letters I get are from women. And I'm told by booksellers that four out of five people who buy serious fiction are women. So. I guess that proves what you say. Oh, good for us. Yeah. <laughs> you know, going back to the one that didn't come out so well in your book, the way I was introduced to you, a friend of mine arrived at my door one day, and she handed me a book, and she said, read this. You'll love it, and I predict great things for this author. And it was Staggerford really? by John Hassler. Uh -huh. And so I read it, and ah, oh, just absolutely loved it. But I became so 
so upset when this young man was killed. I know, yeah. Um, I was upset too. But then uh, I knew from page one it would happen. You did? I knew it had to be the last week in his life. This is Steigerford now, this is my first novel. Uh, I wrote it that way in, in the first draft. I wrote it so the reader knew from page one that he was going to die because at the end of each chapter I had a scene from after his funeral, a flash forward. And then I decided to try it again and, and see if I could reproduce the shock that something like that causes in people. And evidently it worked because I have a lot of readers who were shocked. Some have actually called me up at that point in the book, giving me hell for writing it. <laughs> I, I don't know why. I guess uh, when I, you know, you got to think about what killed Miles. It was the government getting in there and uh, so ham-handedly handling the whole thing. Uh, when I when when I heard about Waco on 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 the radio one day, I thought, that's I wrote about that in Staggerford. Mm -hmm. I mean, the National Guard comes in, they camp out in this woman, this mad woman's barnyard, they kill all her chickens, they drive her nuts. And that's what happened in Waco, too, I think. We drove those people. Just, it was, it was awful. Well, it was a good book, and after reading Staggerford, I agreed with my friend that I hoped, at least, there would be many more forthcoming, and of course there were. Yeah, well, How many in all now, Ken? Eleven, eleven. Eleven. Eleven novels now, yes. Wow. I, I knew when I started that I'd have to keep, uh, keep, uh, keep writing novels in order to make it. I mean, it's, it, the age has passed when you can write one book and then be remembered for it. So I've worked hard at these, and I didn't start, you know, real early in life. I started writing at 37. I published my first novel at the age of 44. But I've been working hard at it ever since, and I've published 11 now since 1977. You know, I have the feeling that you enjoy writing. Oh, of course I do. I mean, there's no greater privilege in the world than to be able to sit at your desk every morning and just pick, pick over your brain, you know, pick over your memories, just work away at this stuff, fit, fit your ideas into language, and that's wonderful. That's what I was born to do, I believe. And you make things happen. Yeah, right. You're in control of everybody in that book, you know. You bet. That's great. <laughs> That's kind of wonderful. It sure is, yeah. <laughs> I'd like that. <laughs> yeah. uh, when you start a book, do you have it pretty well thought out in your mind as to what's going to go? Or do you just start and it just comes to you as, you, as you're going as to what's yeah. going to develop? I have a good idea of the, of the opening and, and of the main characters, and that's all I have. Then I go with that, and I discover day by day as I work what will happen. I, th I sometimes think if I knew ahead of time I wouldn't want to write the book, or I wouldn't need to, you know. I discover as I write. And uh, a lot of secondary characters come into the book then, you see, as, uh, all along the way. I don't know where they come from. I, I don't know where people like uh, Angelo Corelli in this book. He's the assistant dean. He's so full of life. He's so enthusiastic. He's so important to this book. I never saw him coming. He stepped in at just the right moment. And he's wonderful. I don't know where... They, they come from off to the side of me somewhere, and I don't look very closely at where they come from for fear I might disturb them. I think there, there are a lot of other people out there waiting to, to come on on stage, and I, I, hope that, I hope that's true. Well, that's one of the things that probably keeps you so interested in writing. Huh? Exactly. I mean, if you knew the end, yeah, uh, right. you might say, well, I don't need to write yeah. this one. Well, in reading a book, don't we like surprises? Yeah. And, and I like surprises as I write, too. See, that's what keeps me going. Uh, that's wonderful. They, I, this is completely out of anything, but is your, is your name really Jonathan? No, it isn't. It's John. It is? I was named after a fictional character. Oh. I didn't learn this until uh, recent years when a cousin of mine who lived with us when I was very small told me that my mother was reading the Foresight Saga when she was pregnant with me. And uh, in that book we have Irene, who gives birth to Jolyon, the youngest Jolyon in that book, and his nickname is John, J-O-N. And he's well loved, and so she called me John, J-O-N, after that character. So oh, it's fitting, I guess, that I grew up to be a novelist. <laughs> that's interesting. Yeah, that's, that's a wonderful book, incidentally, The Foresight Saga. John Galsworthy is pretty much, pretty much forgotten these days, but I, yeah. I like that book a lot. Uh, now, when you wrote your second book, your second one was Simon's Night, right? Yes, right. And I, of course, am particularly fond of Simon's Night because when it was adapted for the stage, I played Mrs. Yes, Biggs. Of course, you're perfect, <laughs> Mrs. Biggs. 
I sort of a ditzy woman, you know. Yeah. I loved being Mrs. Biggs. <laughs> she was just a, ended yeah. up being a good friend of mine. Oh, good, I really fun. empathized yeah. with her. Yeah. Um, then you wrote Grand Opening. Next came The Love Hunter. Oh, The Love Hunter. Yes. Okay, I liked that one too. Yeah, oh. okay. That was quite different, really. No, yeah, it was. It was different from other books. Uh, I don't know exactly how. Um, it was based on a case of MS that a friend of mine contracted when we were young teachers together, and he died 15 years later, and I watched him go through this decline. So that, that case of MS in the book is, was based on real life, Bob Nielsen from Faustin, Minnesota. But uh, the, lo the love story that, uh, that accompanied it, I made that part up. Mm. I thought it was a very tender book. Uh, I got almost teary over these people. <laughs> yeah, well, they had a lot of problems, certainly. Uh huh. Then the hunting, the, the hunting episode in Lake Manitoba that goes on and on in that uh, book. That occupies a lot of it. That that was a that was an experience I had when my youngest son graduated from high school. I took him up to a hunting camp, which turned out to be a dump, just like the one in the book. But he loved it. Well, there was a lot of suspense. As I recall, oh, yes. too, in that hunting scene. Is he going to do away with him or isn't yeah, he? Exactly, and, yeah. uh, yeah, I kept thinking no, but I kept reading, wondering, well, look what he did to uh, Pruitt in the uh, stagger okay, board. Yes, Maybe okay, he'll yeah. do away with this one. <laughs> but yeah, you can't trust me, that's no. for sure. <laughs> uh -huh. Anyway, that, that, that has the most, uh, the most dramatic plot of anything I've, read, I've written, I think. I think it starts on page one and doesn't end till the end of the book. I think it builds nicely. Mm -hmm. And then came Grand Opening, right? And then came The Green Journey, 85. I obviously should have had a list oh, down here. Of, of yeah, we're going to get to, to a Grand Opening. <laughs> and but. Green Journey was the first time that you introduced Agatha McGee. No, it wasn't. She, wasn't she was in the very beginning. Yeah, she wasn't a main character, though. She was in Staggerford as Miles Pruitt's landlady. Mm -hmm. Then she came into her own in, in Grand Opening. I, you know, I remembered her so well from Staggerford because she was so good to this young woman who yeah, had right. been in love with and Be Beverly comforted, Bingham, yeah. af comforted her after he was killed. And obviously she was, you know, kind of in agony herself over that day. Yeah, right. Yeah, they consoled one another. And and mm. then in Green Journey, and of course I remember because I thought I understand you didn't watch it because you were writing another book <coughs> and didn't want to, but I saw Angela Lansbury play it on television. Did you watch that eventually? Last week. Oh, did you? What did you think? Seven years later, I watched it. I loved it. Did you? I had tears in my eyes. Uh, parts of it. I was so moved by it. Yeah, I did watch it. My wife prevailed upon me. She said it wouldn't hurt me. Although I do have still another Agatha book to write, I oh, I, uh, I, I thought I'd chance it, and and, and I, I did, and it, it didn't distort, distort my image of Agatha because Angela Lansbury is not my image of Agatha, but it didn't hurt me to watch it. I loved it. Yeah, so it was very well done. The ending was different, of course, because Hollywood has to have happy endings. But, yes. <laughs> but even that seemed uh, seemed pretty well prepared for in that movie. I didn't mind it so much. Mm hmm. Yeah, technically they certainly did a good job, yeah, and did. I thought they were they were more or less true to John Hassler. I did too. Uh, yeah, it had the flavor, I think. Uh -huh. Sure. That was really there. Could I ask you, where did you come up with the character of Agatha McGee? I mean, she's so kind of wonderful. I feel maybe she's based on somebody or a number of people that you knew, a composite or. Well, you know, she was born in 1972, and my older son was in the eighth grade, and he came home from school one day, and he said, uh, we had a poet in class today, and I thought, that's wonderful. The teachers are bringing poets to class. And he told me some of the words this poet used in class, obscene words, vulgarisms. And I got upset, and I started complaining about this, see. I was going all over town complaining about this, and I realized I sound just like some spinster school teacher. <laughs> And so I made up uh, the spinster school teacher, Agatha McGee, and I had the, hi this hippie poet come to her class and read his toilet poems to the class. And she uh, empties the schoolhouse in 45 seconds by uh, opening the fire alarm. That solves that problem. I, that was a short story. That was the second short story I ever published. It was published in the South Dakota Review, and then in uh, Staggerford. I put it in as a chapter in the book to introduce her, you see. Uh -huh. So that's where she was born. 
but as 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 time went on, I needed to say more about her because uh, so much of my mother was in her. I think uh, my mother grew fairly rigid as she got older, and it was uh, it was something that upset me somewhat. I think I was always trying to to sort of open her up the way I was trying to open up Agatha up, and. Uh, my mother loved Agatha. She'd read a book by Agatha and she'd say, my, isn't that just like Aunt Elizabeth? <laughs> Since I had a maiden aunt school teacher, and I'd say yes. She never knew how much of herself was in Agatha <laughs> McGee. And you weren't about to tell her. No, I didn't tell her. No. Well, Agatha is, is fascinating, and I, I guess one of the things I like about Agatha is that she could ring a school bell and, and empty the class when she didn't like what was going on. And so, yet there was... Uh, a humanness about her and a kindness and plus her objectivity you know her ability to look at her friends and and neighbors as she did in uh, in some of those letters mm -hmm. with uh, yeah right yeah she's very James steady eyed she she has a good uh, she has a good idea what's going on around her as my mother did she was very alert all her life she died at the age of 91 at, at, her, at her funeral, uh, the night before her funeral, in fact, uh, the priest came up to me and said, I'd like you to tell me some things about your mother so I can use them in the homily tomorrow. And I said, well, first of all, her memory was better than mine. And he said, yes, she's told me that. <laughs> so she was very alert all her life. And she never, she was very steady-eyed. She never pulled any punches with people. <laughs> she was like Agatha. But she was kind, too. You know, in each of, each of the books, there's an episode where Agatha does take care of somebody like Janet Raft and mm -hmm. Green Journey and Beverly Bingham and Staggerford to show her her kind her kindly side. Yeah, she's. Uh, I, I don't think that anyone in need would ever be turned away by Agatha. Maybe. No, no, no. That's true. Uh, yeah. Even if they weren't the most mm -hmm. savory character in the world, I think she could overlook a lot if they really right. needed if they really needed her. I like her. I'm glad to hear she's going to turn up again. Yeah, I have I have a book about her cooking at the back of my mind, and when I finish my current project, which is uh, my memoirs, I oh good. I hope to get to that. I didn't know you were doing that. I am. Yes, I'm about half through now or more. I oh. hope to finish it next spring, actually. Oh, I'd always thought that um, someday somebody was going to write your biography, and they would call it Dear John. <laughs> well, maybe, but this is going to be called Days Like Smoke. Days Like Smoke. It's, uh, it's from a psalm. Ah, okay. Okay. Well, I'll be anxious to, to see that. Okay. Now we're going to get to grand opening yet. Does that come? Okay, it's next, yes. Okay, <laughs> here we go. Grand opening. Which, uh, which became a play and was presented last year at the, at the Lyric Theater here in Minneapolis, 1997, 1996. Mm -hmm. Now, is, were you the little boy? Oh, yes. <laughs> yes, I was. When I was 10 years old, we, we moved from Minneapolis to Plainview, <clears throat> down near Rochester, where my father bought this store, and uh, it was a ruin, you know. There wasn't much to it. And uh, he built up a good business over it. We stayed there eight years. The people in that book only stayed one, but we stayed eight years and, uh, until I graduated from high school. So I think of that as the idyllic part of my life, really. I loved it down there. No. I, you know, small towns are kind of wonderful. I think I mentioned to you once that I was born in Plummer, Minnesota. Yes, right. Yeah. <laughs> one of those very small. Yeah. And as a matter of fact, just last weekend, my one living sister is in Crookston, Minnesota. And I went to visit her and then took a side trip through Plummer. Uh -huh. And it, it's just the same. Yeah, right, yeah. <laughs> Except there are even fewer buildings, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, or maybe, you know, as a child, you think everything's big. Yeah, right, yeah. <laughs> and, uh, it gets very small as time goes on. Um, in, in writing, in writing grand opening, I was surprised at how uh, how many negative things I had to say about the town. It's as though I was compensating for all that uh, that golden haze that hung over it all my life, you know, in my memory. And the religious conflict in that town came to mind, and I made quite a bit of that. I probably exaggerated it in the book for for dramatic purposes, but it was there certainly. Catholics versus Lutherans. Yeah, you know, in Plummer, there's something sort of, I think, unusual. They took pictures and put it in the paper once. All of the churches of all the denominations are lined up in a row. 
it starts with the Methodists and then the Lutheran and then another kind of Lutheran and then the Baptists and then I think it's the Presbyterian and on the very end are the Catholics. Yeah, so. so on Sunday morning all of the denominations <laughs> all lined oh. up on this one oh, dear. church street. <laughs> I think actually we have some clips from uh, grand opening. Wouldn't they be kind of fun to see? Would be, yes. Let's, okay. Let's watch some let's of those. Sam people says there's a lot of animosity in this town between Catholics and Lutherans. So I've heard. Is it true? I have no idea. I mean, how do you get along with the Lutheran pastor? Haven't met him. Oh, he's here in town? No, he was here when I came. And Yes, relatively. I've only been here seven years. <laughs> That's a lovely flower you're wearing. Oh, you like that? Pick it off a gravesite bouquet. Oh. Now then, uh, Catherine, I was just showing your husband about your grand opening sale. This is how they do it in Rochester. Piggly Wiggly, grand opening. Prizes every hour. Free marshmallow to each kid. Free bar of soap to each housewife. Now, you got to do that, you two. You got to kick off your business with a big shindig like that. And, you know, John, speaking of, of your plays that have been dramatized, Dear James is another one that uh, was put on stage. Yeah. Mm. And that's Agatha McGee again. Mm. And um, she's, uh, there it is, Dear James. Yeah, this is uh, this I wrote. This was published in '93, and uh, Sally Childs wrote the screen or the stage version of this. And uh -huh. It's uh, it's very good. It's on in the present time. You know, there's some poetry in 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 that book. Would you like to mm -hmm. read some of us? That's in the Dean's what? List. Oh, it's in the yeah, Dean's right. List, my, isn't my it? Your very book. latest. Yeah, right. Yeah. This, this is this came out in June of this year. Why does poetry come to mind when I'm talking to you? I wonder. <laughs> <clears throat> Poetry means more to me than ever right now in my older years for some reason. All these poems I memorized as a kid come back to me. I say them all the time. I, I just love reading poetry. In, in, this, in this book, it's a, there's a poet comes to campus. And this book has an appendix. It's one of the few novels you read with an appendix in it. And uh, the appendix is the Rookery Chapbook, Ten Poems by Richard Falcon. Richard Falcon is, is the poet who comes to, to Rookery. And I'll read one here. It's, it's called, To My Neighbor Anne Docking, Who Wishes Someone Would Write Her a Sonnet. And the girl who longs for sonneteers has found herself 400 years too young. Their moans of, of love and silence lie compiled and bound in, in books as dusty as their bones. Yet so urgent seem their pleas when scanned upon the page she prays the distant age return when ladies could at whim demand a nightly verse delivered by a page. Instead, her mail contains a card in prose demanding she present without delay a book of sonnets with the fee she owes for dreaming silly dreams an extra day. I hope these 14 lines may see her through till the age of Petrarch dawns anew. That's lovely. In, when I taught high school, of course, uh, there would always be a girl in class who fell in love with sonnets and loved sonnets of Shakespeare, and she, they'd, they'd wish somebody would write them a sonnet. So I, I got that off my chest about that time, way back in the 50s. I can remember in high school that I just loved sonnets. Is sure. this a high school thing? It must be, sure. <laughs> yeah. Just loved them, and I wrote them. Yeah. Well, this, this poet, this poet has, he, he recites quite a bit of poetry in here, and it's poems, poems I wrote in the 50s and 60s when I took myself seriously as a poet which I don't anymore. Do you have another one in there? You're like, you don't have one of your... <clears throat> no, that, that's, uh, that's, that's the one. I, that's the one. Day. That's one, one a day is enough. Yes. <laughs> one a day is <laughs> Oh, John, now, now tell me, um, I understand because you let it slip to me one night, uh, evening at a party, <laughs> mm -hmm. um, that you're writing a play yourself. I am. I'm, I'm writing a play myself, and it's, it's a play from scratch, and it's called A Staggerford Murder. And I finished the first draft. I had some friends come to my cabin and read it, take the parts to see if it's any good. And they, everybody laughed and was moved by the right thing, so I guess I'll keep working on it and try to develop it. Now, is this going to be the same characters that were in Staggerford? Some, some of the same. It's, it's mostly misfits. It's French and Imogene. And, uh, 
there's a new character. He's a garbage man named Dusty. And Dusty's unsavory wife, whose name is Caledonia. They're sitting around uh, having this conversation in this hotel lobby, the, the, the Morgan Hotel, Rundown Hotel. They're talking about a murder that happened in town many years ago, and they, in, in, well, nine years ago, actually. And in, in discussing it, they discover who the murderer is. It was unsolved at the time. And the murderer is one of them. That's all I'll say for now. All right. That sounds fascinating. Yeah, I think it works. Is yeah. there a part in it for me? Yes. There's. Uh, you want to be the garbage man's wife? Sure. Okay. Well, that sounds neat. Cal Caledonia. <laughs> cool. <laughs> what makes your big head so hard? <laughs> okay. His, uh, her, her husband calls her Caledoni. Caledoni. Oh. oh, sounds great. See, I think, you know, getting back to J Dear James again for a minute, I think we have some... Um, some TV film too on from Dear okay, James. Let's watch that. Let's sure. watch it. Well, I thought I was safe, sure, but I like to be across the ocean. I never thought you'd come over and see me. <laughs> <laughs> we are from trying to travel to America. I said, I can't imagine my panic when you wrote to my coming over. <laughs> I can't. You're right. I not, can't be sure, James. Right. And please, if we do, allow me to write first. I like that too. That's, I love Dear James. But you know that time, as usual, is running out, and we didn't get a chance to cover all of your books. For instance, North of Hope, and I loved that book. And Rookery Blues, mm -hmm. which was the one you wrote just before the Dean's List, right, yeah. and I think mm -hmm. the Dean's List is sort of a spin-off from yes, um, yes, right. from <clears throat> from Rookery Blues, and then the children's books, which we haven't been able to get into at all. But I just wanted to ask you one personal question. I noticed that you dedicate uh, uh, the Dean's List, or yeah, the Dean's List to. Um, Robert Spade. Yes, right. Yeah, he was a good friend of mine. You know, he was yeah, dean at St. John's. Too. Yeah, yeah. I knew. T I knew. Uh, yeah, Robert well, Spade. I miss him. A lot of people miss him a lot. He oh, died in yeah. 1994. He died three years ago. Yeah. Have you? <clears throat> do we find him in this book at all? No, no, I don't think so. It's just about a dean. That's all. Yeah. <laughs> Except his dislike for athletics might might be the only similarity with Leland uh, <laughs> Edwards. Well, we miss him. And I'm sure that if he were here, he would be yeah. very happy with that. It was that book. Whitley Miss I most, I think. You know, I, I went to Ireland, England, with him one time, and every corner we turned, he had something witty to say. We miss people with wit, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I knew I knew Bob mostly through politics with yeah. uh, sure, Gene McCarthy sure. during Gene McCarthy's time, and uh, it, was, it was Bob who brought me to St. John's from Brainerd in 1980. Well, hey, John. Bob, we miss you. This was talking with John Hassler, a real privilege. And I hope that you'll all read his books. I know you've read most of them probably, but take a look too at Dean's List, which is the latest one out. And don't forget there are other things in the works. A play and then John's autobiography, which I really want to get my hands on. So thank you so much, John. My pleasure. Oh, it's been a real pleasure for me. Do you have any last words you'd like to? Well, no, I guess uh, I'll just go home and continue writing now. Oh, that's the okay. thing to do. Okay, okay. Yeah. Writers are people who write. Right, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Somebody told me that once. They're not the people who talk about it. They're the ones who really do it. So thank you. Again, it's been a privilege. My pleasure. Thanks.